We are concluding our study tonight on the deity of Jesus. Two weeks ago, as we introduced this study, we we looked at those who rejected the deity of of Jesus. And we looked at the, the, the Jewish rejection of Jesus as the Son of God from the standpoint of the gospel accounts. We also looked at ancient scoffers, ancient doctrines and philosophies that developed which denied the deity of Christ, as well as modern-day manifestations in the form of of false religions such as Islam, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and Mormons. Last week, we looked at what the Old Testament had to say. We looked at Old Testament prophecies that pointed toward Jesus, that pointed toward Jesus. Jesus as the Christ, or the Anointed One of God, the One sent by God, the the Son of God. And in particular, Psalm number 2, and Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, which we'll begin a study of that verse uh, two weeks from tonight, Lord willing. And we looked at how those prophecies were fulfilled in Jesus, and how those prophecies served to confirm the deity of Christ. Now tonight, as we conclude this series, we're going to look at the New Testament perspective of, of, of this matter tonight. And we're going to begin with the statements of Jesus as well as his actions. And again, as you're going to notice throughout this study, this is going to tie in with what we've been studying on Sunday morning, the miracles of Jesus. So, you, so again, this, this helps us in that regard as well. But as we get into our lesson tonight, let's look first of all at the claims of Jesus. And number one, I want us to note that he claimed to be God. Turn, if you will, first of all, back to the Old Testament. Let's go to Exodus chapter 3. And and someone read verse number 14 for us. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. In the context, again... God has called Moses. Remember, Moses met God at that burning bush. And God commissions Moses to go to Pharaoh that that he would bring forth God's people, the children of Israel, out out of Egypt. Verse number 10. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God would go on to tell him, I will be with thee. Moses then responds, What shall I say to the children of Israel who, who, sent, who sent me? When they ask him, me, What is his name? What is the name of the God of our fathers? What shall I say unto him? Notice what God tells Moses here. Verse 14. Thank you, Brooke. I am, or the great I am. It is interesting, this is, I am, the, the, the Hebrew word, the, the literal rendering of this is four letters. Y-H-W-H, which became Jehovah, ultimately, literally means Yahweh. God is the I am, and this speaks of his etern- eternal nature. Now, why point this out? Why do we point out this statement that that God made to Moses here in Exodus chapter 3? Well, you go to the book of John. You go to the gospel accounts of John. And seven times in that particular book, what does Christ say about himself? I am exactly right, Dusty. Seven times we see Christ use that phrase, I am. In other words, he is declaring, I am God. Now, is he declaring that he is God the Father and the Holy Spirit? Absolutely not. Three of all things. Exactly, Ricky. He is the eternal Word. He is God the Son, the one sent from God. And so you, you think about the significance of this phrase. You know, I am the door to the sheepfold. Well, who is the door? Well, would not, not, could we not say God is the door? It still still means the same thing because Jesus is God. I am the good shepherd. That is, God is the good shepherd. Again, David said it well, Psalm 23, did he not? The Lord is my shepherd and Jesus Christ is the Lord. I am the resurrection and the life. Well, who is the resurrection and the life? 
you see what the, the thrust of, it, of what Christ is saying there, what he is trying to get his, his hearers to grasp? Trying to produce faith in, in them that he is God, that he was sent by the Father, and that he was the, the Son. Then you think about the statement he made in John 8, 58. And this really drove those unbelieving Jews angry, did it, did it not? When he, ta- when he ta- told them before Abraham was, I am. And how did those Jews react? With unbelief. Again, before Abraham, there was Jesus. That denotes again his eternal nature. That, and it corresponds exactly with the record of John. John 1 verse 1, in the beginning was God and the Word. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. So he cl- made these claims and these claims are certainly seen in his I am statements. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, who is the way? Jesus is the way, or God is the way. And then you ultimately tie this in with Acts chapter 20, verse 28, when Paul told the Ephesian elders to feed, to feed what? The, well, the flock, but the church of whom? Church of God, but, but Cindy said Christ. And certainly, which, and that's correct as well, because in that same verse, Feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Well, who was it that shed their blood on the cross? Jesus. Jesus the Son, the second person of the Trinity, or the Godhead, if you will. So, we're not doing any harm to the text there, are we, when we, when, when we might substitute God for, for Christ or Jesus? Because we're dealing with the same thing, are we not? Feed the church of God, or we might say, feed the church of Christ, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Isn't it beautiful how all of these passages, in essence, connect together? You know, this, this shows to us the, the, the unity the, the, of God's word, the harmony in it. In fact, you might look at God's word as a masterpiece, as part of a painting it, you know, every aspect of it, part, each part flows from one part to the next. It all fits beautifully together. So we see these claims. But also, he claimed to be equal with God. That is, he claimed for himself the prerogatives of God. Now, I don't want to spend much time on this point because we're going to get into this in our study on Sunday morning in class. In Mark chapter 2 and verse 5, He heals a man with the palsy, or a paralytic man. And again, I'm not going to spend much, we don't want to spend much time here because we're going to deal with it Sunday morning, but the point we want to to derive is this. What Christ told this man, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now how did these religious leaders react here in this text? And again, we're going to come back and revisit this. They were accusing him of blasphemy and and Christ goes on to rebuke them and and the miracle proves that he had this power, this authority to forgive sins and uh, so Christ forgave sins but only God can forgive sins and the Pharisees recognized that, did they not? That only God could forgive? But why, why do you think they could not come to believe that Jesus was sent by God and that he was the very son of God. He was too meek and lowly. Too meek and lowly. That's a good point, Dusty. So what kind of Messiah were they looking for? They were looking for an earthly king, something more boisterous. Yeah. So they were sorely disappointed. And they didn't let their disappointments be hidden. Even though Christ produced time after time after time that he, by his his mighty deeds that he performed, that he was who he claimed to be. You know, it's often said the proof is in the pudding. 
but yet they refuse to accept the truth. You think about John chapter 5, verses 25 through, through 29, that marvelous section of Scripture there. Christ has the power, the authority to raise and to judge the dead. But again, only God has the power to raise and to judge the dead. We're told in Romans 1, verse number 4, that Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power or by power through His resurrection, through His own resurrection from the dead. Of course, Christ's resurrection from the dead, He serves as to give us hope of the future resurrection to come because He is the resurrection and the life. Remember the I am statement that we just talked about. Again, God is the great I am. Christ said, I am, therefore Christ is God. And God is the resurrection and the life. Further, he claimed to be the Son of God. What did he say in John 3.16? I quote it so much, let's let someone else quote it here. For God... Excellent, Dusty. Very good. Thank you so much. The Father, God, that is the Father, gave His only begotten Son. And of course, his, only, his Son there is Jesus Christ. Again, the context, He's discussing with Nicodemus. And that's still in the same context of the new discussion of the new birth, by the way. And that's an interesting study in and of itself, as we, we all understand. So he made that claim, that great, profound declaration there, in what we often refer to as the golden text of the Bible. In John chapter 5, in, in verse number 23, talking about the judgment that was given to him by the Father, he declares here that... that all men should honor or reverence the Son even as they honor or reverence the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. And so this is a serious matter. If, if men truly claim to, re, to fear God and re, reverence God, Christ must be shown that same fear and reverence, mustn't he? Same fear and reverence. Because if we don't, are we really reverencing the Father? Christ here is saying, no, no, we're not. And so these verses here, Christ's declarations, prove Him to be the Son of God. And again, the evidences that He had already set forth before these individuals, before these Jews who sought to kill Him, should have produced faith in them. There was no excuse for them not to have faith. And again, there's no excuse for anyone today not to come to faith in God, is there? But how tragic is it when you hear more and more people trying to make the claim that there is no God? That's the challenge we're faced with, is it, is it not? More and more... I'm afraid, as we think about our mission of evangelism, the church's work of evangelizing, more and more it's going to be the case, I'm afraid, that when we strive to teach people, we're going to have to begin with the, react, with the existence of God. We're going to have to go all the way back to this, pit, to this crucial point, giving them the evidence that God is. You think about years gone by, most people would accept the, the reality that there is a God. Did they not? But what are we seeing in this day and age? Fewer people, more and more denying the reality of God, the existence of God, even though nature itself declares the very glory of God. Why do you think, and let, let's, let's, we've got a little bit of time that we can ponder this, why do you think so many people are rejecting the reality of God? And to reject the reality of God is to reject the reality of Christ. Because they want to do exactly what they want to do. They don't want to do what God says. They don't want to do what God says. 
think the more we're blessed, the more we forget God. That's another good point, Ricky. The more we're blessed, the more we forget God. Again, look at the United States of America. How blessed have we been? And, and look how far away from God we've moved. And remember, the, this, this country was established on biblical principles. The men who founded this country were not Christians in the biblical sense, but they believed that there was God and they believed the Bible was the Word of God. You take 9-11, you know, you've seen a lot of people come to church right after 9-11 and, and you had a long time. Mm -hmm. they did but for a very short period of time here's your one you might consider I have a book in my office it's a really interesting book called Forged in Faith written by Rod Gregg during the sessions of the first continental congress you know how they began each session prayer, prayer. oh you try to begin any session with in prayer today and what's going to happen you're going to be in big trouble you're going to have all you're going to have the atheist the humanist and more and probably the ACLU on, on, on you we used to begin school with a prayer and a bible verse over the intercom mm -hmm. and a pledge of allegiance oh the pledge of allegiance can you even say God that now when you say the pledge you can't say the pledge so you can't even say the pledge now See what's happening to our... And I saw on TV where this coach, after the game, he has a prayer with whoever wants to come out there. It's not, you know, nothing to do with school, and they were stopping him from that. That is sad. Not surprising, though. When we reject God, we are dishonoring God. And that's what our na nation, what, that's what a vast number of people are doing today is dishonoring God by rejecting His reality. And also we understand that to, to reject God, reject His existence is to reject Christ. And in reality it's to reject the existence of sin as well. And if you're going to reject sin, you might as well go ahead and reject the existence of Satan. And then, then when you reject all of that, it's going to be anything and everything goes, isn't, is it not? You know, you know you might say that. We could say that. I wouldn't go. I've wondered about that. You know. That's a good question. You could make the case. Remember what the psalmist said: "The fool hath said in their heart there is no God." So we know the description of the person. And uh, it's not believing the Holy Spirit. Just blasphemy. There's a lot of ways you can blaspheme God, no doubt about that. And that, show, that just goes to show you the irrationality of sin, does it not? And I'm going to preach a two-part lesson a few weeks down the line on Psalm 14 and tie it in with Romans chapter 1 about just how foolish sin is. Blasphemy is the act of enforcing or showing contempt for lack of reverence for God to religious or holy persons or things or persons can consider sacred or inviolable. So you, there's a lot of ways you can blaspheme God. It's, it's to dishonor God as well. Well, you try to sin against the Holy Spirit. Denying the existence of the Holy Spirit, denying the existence of God, denying the teachings of this book. There's a lot of ways you can sin in that manner, John. Well, you know, if you deny the Bible, because the Bible was inspired. Yep. That would, indeed. Oh, we can get into a whole discussion on this now. So, but that, you know, that's a lot of ways. And in reality, when we do all this, it's showing dishonor to Christ and dishonor to the Father. And to dishonor the Holy Spirit as well, for that matter. Who, who guided these men to, to, to write these words. There is a sin that's unforgivable. It's a sin unto death. But I suggest to you the only sin that can't be forgiven is the sin that's not repented of. One that won't turn from their sin and come to Christ. So he claimed to be, be the Son of God. He also claimed to be the Messiah. John 8 verse 24. 
Again, notice this. We understand the reality of faith, of belief. Christ told those Jews, ye shall die in your sins if ye believe not that I am who? He that was sent. Now it's interesting in the King, in the King James that he is italicized. That means it was supplied by the translators. Literally Christ is saying, if ye believe not that I am. In other words, he's saying, you're going to die in your sins if you don't believe that I am God. That I am the Son sent by God. Which takes that verse, understanding that, to, to an even greater level of significance. Further, he accepted worship. Now, we understand the Old Testament forbade worship to any object other than God, according to Deuteronomy 5, verses 6 through 9. But the new, in the New Testament, principle is true as well. Uh, remember, Cornelius tried to worship Peter, and Peter rebuked him for it. And... Uh, and John tried to worship the angel, an angel there in Revelation 22. But remember what the angel told him, worship God. However, when you look at passages such as Mark 14, 33 and John 20, verse 20 in Mark 15, 25, you're going to find that Christ accepted worship at various times. And since only God is to be worshipped and Christ accepted worship, therefore Christ is God. So those were the claims of Jesus that, we can, that can back up his deity. What are some of the actions? Well, obviously, as we're discussing on Sunday morning, his miracles, the miracles that he performed that demonstrated him to be the Son of God. John 20, verses 30 and 31, as we've alluded to. Further, you think about his sinless life. In John chapter 1, verse 29, Jesus is identified as who? As being what? The Lamb of God. The Lamb sent from God. And uh, not only was He the Lamb of God, He is the Lamb which does what? Takes away what? Sins of the world. Sins of the world. John 1, 29. That, that's a powerful verse, is it not? That's a marvelous verse. A lot of significance in, in that verse, as well as all the other allusions to Christ as being the Lamb of God. We also understand he was without spot or blemish, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 19. Now, what if Christ had spot or blemish? Couldn't have been the Lamb of God. Remember the Passover Lamb? You go back to, to the book of Exodus... Israel was required to offer up lambs that were what? Perfect. Without spot and without blemish. So God providing for sin, the cure for sin, had to offer up a lamb without his lamb, the lamb, that was without spot or without blemish. He knew no deceit. He knew no sin. He is tempted like as we are, but without sin. Hebrews chapter 4, verse, verse number 15. Again, it's ama amazing. He knew all the hardships of life that we, we have. He, he, he was tempted just as we are, but yet without sin. He overcame temptation, and I suggest as Christians, we need to do a lot more studying from, on, on the temptation of Christ, do we not? We need to look to his example of how to overcome temptation. And uh, he used the scriptures to battle the devil. So what's it going to take for us to defeat our enemy, the devil, today? Study. Study. Use the scriptures. And know, that obviously, to use the scriptures properly, we have to know the scriptures. Child hears that all of his life. He doesn't know the difference, and he 
When he grows up and has children, he can't tell his children the right way because he's been taught the commandments of men. That's the problem we're facing today is a lot of people, and you and I talked about this today, Ricky, about people just following the family religion rather than God's, God's way. That's what happens when you remove the Bible. Not just from society, but above all, the home. And uh, we've got to get back to teaching book, chapter, and verse. That's what it's going to take, is it not? Book, chapter, and verse, preaching, teaching. And uh, when we do that, we're demonstrating ourselves not to be ashamed of the gospel. Mm-hmm. It would be very hard to go against their teaching to, to know that they loved you and that they were trying to teach you right for you to say that they were wrong. It would. But again, remember as well what Christ said in Matthew 10, 34 through 39, that a man's enemies would be they of his own household as well. And uh, the, the gospel does divide, unfortunately. You know, and it, it, it's a challenge. But as Christians, we have to be willing to meet the challenge. You know, how do we reach these people? You know, we just show concern for them and just kindly and patiently teach them. That's all. You, that's all you can do. And eventually, you know, you know, some come out. And uh, I've seen them, and I'm pretty sure you've seen people like that as well. We just have to. You just have to keep at it. I guess I'm trying to say. Didn't Jesus say he was going to turn brother against brother, whether Yeah, he did, Cindy. But again, that's through the preaching of the word. Some would accept it, some, some would not. Further, when we think about Christ, John 8, 46, he, he, uh, he challenged his accusers to convict him of sin, which they could not do. And again, his impeccable character, his perfect character, serves as supporting evidence affirming his claim as God. But not only do we have the, 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 the statements and the actions of Jesus, we look at those men who, who penned these inspired words. They attributed to Jesus various titles befitting God. Revel, and John in Revelation 1.17 as well as chapter 22 and verse 13, he is referred to as the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And again, that's significant in, in the Greek alphabet. The Greek, first Greek word of the Greek alphabet is Alpha, and the last Greek word, gr Greek letter is Omega. That's where first and the last comes in. Signifies his eternal nature. Before time was, before anything was, there he was. And after time ends, there he, there he will be. That's a, that's a significant statement there. Obviously, we see in the, in the parable of the ten virgins, as well as Revelation 21, verse 2, he is the bridegroom. Now, what is his bride? The church. The beautiful bride of Christ. The church of God that he purchased with his own blood. Acts 20, 28. And of course, it is his body over which he is the Savior. And uh, I'm going to preach a lesson Sunday night. I'll give you a quick preview. You, and uh, you can invite, I encourage you to invite friends. And it's a theme we're emphasizing. And, you know, you've heard it said, join, you know, attend the church or join the church of your choice. We need to consider the church of Jesus' choice. We don't have a choice. We need it's either No. We're going to pre we're going to deal with that Sunday night. The church that Jesus chose that he purchased that he died for. So I hope everyone will be here for that. Again, he he is declared as the son of God, Romans 1 verse 4, uh, the savior of the world, uh, John chapter 4 verse verse number 42 in uh in the, in the context there, we have the belief of the Samaritans. Remember the great conversation that Christ had with, with, the, with the Samaritan woman? The results of her efforts they, was this. They told her, 
We believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves. And know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. And, and again, these were the Samaritans of all people. This is an even greater indictment on those Jews, is it not? That Samaritan woman came to, not, came to, accept, came to not acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah, and so too did her fellow countrymen. Whereas Jesus came into his own, that is, his own creation, and in particular, in a sense, his own Jewish brethren, fleshly brethren, and yet they rejected him. And the list could go on. They considered his disciples, these holy men of old, considered Jesus to be deity. And the, 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 these inspired, the inspired writings are saturated with this fact. And, um, you know, you, you look at Romans chapter 14, and we won't have time to, to read these verses, but Romans 14, 11, and 12, Paul here is quoting from Isaiah chapter 45, 22, and 23, in making application to standing before the judgment seat of, of Christ. And of the, that judgment day that is to come, where all shall bow and confess, every tongue shall confess to God. When they confess in, those who didn't confess Jesus in this life, well, it's going to be too late for them then. They will come to know who Jesus was and is, but again, because they died in a lost condition, they will be in a lost state in eternity. Further, they attributed, these inspired men attributed the power of God to Jesus. Again, we look at creation. God created all things. Genesis 1, verses 1 and following. And God spoke all things into existence. John chapter 1, verse 13. In fact, Paul refers to Jesus in Colossians 1, verse 13 as the firstborn creator. Therefore, because God created all things and the scriptures affirm Christ as, as the eternal word, and God spoke all things into existence by his word, therefore Jesus is God. In fact, all three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit had a part in creation, we might say, as well. Further, his disciples called him deity directly. What did, what did Thomas tell Jesus in John chapter 20, verse 28, when Jesus invited Thomas to touch his nail-scarred hands and reach into his side? What did Thomas confess? My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. You're exactly right, John. My Lord and my God. Profound. Paul said that Christ thought it not robbery to be equal with God and that he was made in the likeness of men. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and following. And of course, we've already alluded to and discussed what John said there in John chapter 1, verses 1 and following. Now with that said, let's now turn our attention to Nicodemus. Turn with me to John. Let's go back to John chapter 3. And I think Nicodemus serves as a powerful piece of evidence as well. John chapter 3. What do you know about Nicodemus? Sanhedrin. <laughs> he was a prominent Pharisee. We, we know that. He was a ruler of the Jews, according to verse number 1. Now, notice what he said in verse 2. If someone would, read that verse for us. John 3, verse, verse number 2. Here you have a Pharisee. Was Nicodemus different than, than from the rest of his Pharisaical cult, from the rest of the Pharisees? He was. What did what was Nicodemus saying here? What was Nicodemus affirming that that uh, that the other Pharisees refused to? Faith in God. Faith in God. Again, he, he's, he saw the truth, he affirmed it, and he accepted it here. And uh, he said, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. 
And he further recognized that no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Nicodemus indicted the rest of the Pharisees, did he not, by this statement, by his actions? And you think about it, you think about it. when Jesus was buried, who, who came and helped Joseph bury, bury Jesus? What's that, Dusty? Nicodemus, exactly. So he recognized Jesus' divine nature. He recognized no man could do these miracles except God be with him. And again, he, this is very important because he accepted the evidences that Christ presented. And again, he, he, he used rational thinking. He saw what Jesus did and he thought, Logically, using common sense. Where's common sense going at these days, by the way? Seems like a lot of people have forgotten what it is. But again, all men would do well to do the same thing as Nicodemus did. Again, and again, this serves as a powerful piece of evidence because unlike the rest of these Jewish religious leaders, Nicodemus did accept the nature of, of Jesus. And so as we have seen in this study, Christ is God, the second person of the Trinity or Godhead. And the evidence confirms this. And uh, since Christ is God and God only can save us from sin. And again, we're going to talk more about this in our class Sunday morning from Mark 2. That's why I didn't dwell on that verse too much. To reject the deity of Christ is to reject salvation. And since Christ is God and God has given us his inspired word, to reject the deity of Christ is to reject the word of God. And since Christ is God, God has all authority, and all authority has been given to the Son by the Father. He has the right to make commands of us. And he has the right to, and he will judge all of us. And, and, and so Christ challenges all men as to what they will do with the evidence. And remember what Christ asked those religious leaders there in Matthew 22, verse 42? The question he asked, what think ye of Christ? But then again, you see in Matthew 16, verse 15 as well, what question did he ask there to his disciples there? Whom do men say, men say that I am? And of course, they got a whole, he received a whole plethora of answers, did he not? But Peter, again, Peter spoke up and declared Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. Again, that answer was based on the evidence, and that evidence produced faith in him. And, and, and that's why we preach Christ. And that's why, that's why it is so important to, to study these matters. Because... If Christ is not the Son of God, well then, the whole of Christianity falls like a deck of cards. This is a foundational doctrine of Christianity. And we're going to look at its birth in, in two weeks, which also serves as a foundational bedrock of Christianity and how it relates back to His deity. So that concludes our study of the deity of Christ. Thank you all so much for your comments and participation. And we'll